We're often asked if software is patentable. Well, the quick answer is, you know, maybe. Uh, the long answer is, you have to kind of go back to 1998 and a federal circuit case called State Street Bank. That's when uh, the, uh, this, this kind of rule that uh, business processes, methods of doing business, were not patentable. Well, the federal circuit said, look, we don't see any reason why uh, business processes and methods of doing business uh, are, are excluded from 35 U.S.C. 101, you know, patent eligible subject matter. Well, all of a sudden, if you think about it, this coincided with the early 2000s dot-com boom. So you had uh, all these businesses and their valuation was amazing. For every single user you had uh, for your website, uh, you were valued as, at, at $1,000 per user. So if you get 1,000 users, you are instantly a millionaire. So all these startups uh, started filing uh, patents on everything and, and the state of the art for patent law at that time really allowed anything goes. So for the next eight or so years, you had these amazingly large portfolios built up on software patents. Now, a lot of them were really good. They were very innovative. Uh, but the concern was we were taking processes that were really well known. Um, tax mitigation strategies, methods of selecting stocks and things like that, that a human typically was able to do and we're just putting it on a computer with really nothing different. And then we're suing people in the Eastern District of Texas for patent infringement. So this uh, unchecked litigation, these large uh, plaintiff uh, jury uh, awards uh, for these software patents started to concern a lot of people and there was this intellectual push uh, to uh, um, take a, a closer look at these. So between 2008 and uh, uh, 2010, we had a case, uh, Bilski, that went through the federal circuit, which is kind of the appellate court for patent cases before you get to the U.S. Supreme Court. And then it finally got to the U.S. Supreme Court. and. The Federal Circuit <clears throat> is very familiar with patent law and what they do is they try to construct these tests that give us constraints and boundaries so we understand what is patentable and what is not patentable. Um, some of the, the concern and, and sometimes frustration is when the U.S. Supreme Court steps in, they basically tell the Federal Circuit what they did wrong, but they don't tell the Federal Circuit what to do. So um, the Federal Circuit had a machine or transformation test at the time that uh, gave us a little bit of some guidance on what would be patentable in, in, in the software field. And the Supreme Court said basically, look, we're not going to adopt that as a hard, fast rule. So uh, um, there was a lot of uncertainty while Bilski was going through the system. And then you can see in 2010, at least we kind of started to feel a little bit better about what we could do. And we saw patent grants kind of go up again. Now. Uh, four years later, the hammer came down. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court did not like what the Federal Circuit was doing, and they rendered a case um, called uh, Alice versus CLS Bank, and they uh, severely restricted uh, the uh, um, patentability of uh, um, processes that they considered abstract. And they didn't really explicitly restrict it. What the Supreme Court did is it injected uncertainty. And there's a lack of guidance. And you can see there is a, uh, uh, from 2014 to 2015, uh, basically a 70% plus drop in the number of uh, patents that were issued in any of these, uh, you know, software electronic fields. So um, it took, uh, you know, several years of guidance, uh, several years of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office trying to create these memorandums for their examiners to try and tell them, you know, what you could allow and what you couldn't allow to kind of finally get us back to where we should have been in the first place. Now, the guidance that the patent examiners still follow by many aspects is still very abstract, very, very difficult to understand. But I'm going to give you just a few tips on what seems to work. Uh, so when you're considering trying to patent your software, uh, probably the first thing and the easiest thing to do is look to your graphic user interface because that can be protected with the design patent, which is the layout of your controls, uh, sometimes even the animation and the way that it moves. And that is not subject to a lot of these uh, Supreme Court uh, decisions that created the uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. 
Um, design patents are pretty easy to get. There's a great recovery, and there's a good history of a lot of big players uh, protecting their uh, graphic user interfaces with these design patents. So that one's a no-brainer and pretty easy to do. Now you have a functional software pro product. Is it eligible for patent protection and is it worth pursuing? Well, uh, one of the things that I advise our clients is look to kind of the artificial intelligence that you may embed into it. Uh, the less interaction uh, that's required by a human user probably the better candidate that it would be. Um, one thing that nobody argues about is that the mental process, the steps of a human are not patentable. So where a human makes a decision to press one button or another button can never be patented. But where you are innovating and you're creating your software process to make those decisions for the human, now you've got a better candidate for patent protection. Uh, the other thing that you can look at is if you're bringing in e external data. So, so for example, if you have a just-in-time inventory system that orders umbrellas, you're bringing in external data from the National Weather Service and you see in five days uh, it's going to be rainy for three weeks, then uh, you have your system automatically order umbrellas without any user intervention. Uh, then uh, you're taking the user out of it, you're using the system to make intelligent decisions, and now you've got a potentially better candidate for software protection.